Becoming a international movie star is a dream that lots of actors have. In Australia, we have a handful of people that have made it really big in Australian cinema. And today we're going to be speaking, talking to one of those actors and he's going to be telling us about his experience. Hi, welcome to the Secret Men's Business Podcast. This is Joey Buzzatul. And on today's show, we're going to be speaking to Steve Bastani, who's going to be talking to us about his acting career and mental health. Steve, how are you? Good, Joe. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate someone of your uh, networking ability and your you know, presence in the community to talk to us about these subjects because it may sh shed some light with mental health and men's uh, suicide prevention. Absolutely. It's a subject very close to my heart and one that um, I'm devoted to raising awareness of. Um, I have a personal experience with that. Uh, I lost my best friend when I in my late 20s to suicide. Uh, and since then, I've had a couple of other people take their own lives in my circle. And uh, it's something that is very close to my heart and something that I've, you know, I'm committed to trying to make a difference in this area. So, you know, I've got a long standing association with um, uh, organizations like Lifeline. Uh, I became a Lifeline ambassador in 2011. And, and after that, when the CEO went over to Are You OK Day, he took me with him and I, and I came along to uh, Are You OK as, a, as an Are You OK Day ambassador. And I'm often sort of called upon to speak on mental health uh, through my own experience as a husband and father who went through two bouts of, um, of postnatal depression with my wife. She was severely incapacitated and hospitalised with two, uh, two of my children um, when she, she gave birth to both my, uh, my, my youngest kids, she had suffered severe postnatal depression and, and I had to educate myself about that and find out how I could support her because my first, uh, you know, my first impulse was to take lots of drugs and alcohol and run, <laughs> and, and run away from it all. So, yeah. uh, and that didn't work uh, so well, as you can yeah. imagine. Um, so I had to educate myself and find out how I could be of, you, of, of help and, and to also realise that it was a family disease, you know, not just her problem. Mm. And was that like at a time when mental health wasn't being talked about a lot for men? It wasn't very much on the radar, particularly for men. Um, you know, when a Lifeline first approached me, I was just finishing up on Neighbours and it was 2011. Um, I'd obviously, I'd, you know, thought a lot about how I could maybe have helped my friend who took his own life um, and, and what I could have done. And I now realise that, you know, you, you, if somebody's, you know, determined to do it, there's very little you can do mm -hmm. other than, um, you know, be there for them and support them and encourage them to talk. But um, it certainly wasn't talked about and, the, you know, there wasn't a spotlight on mental health like there is today. And as I'm sure you know, Joe, that spotlight is only going to get brighter and brighter as yeah. the fallout from corona sort of really takes, um, mm. takes effect. I mean, this, the, you're right, like, um, you know, I run this podcast and I have a men's support group on Facebook and on YouTube. And even though it's 2020, a lot of guys will join, but they'll just watch. So they're still, you know, not coming forward and sharing. And so we've created all these sort of like uh, safe places like men's circles and all that. So, look, do you think that Australian men are a little bit more stoic when it comes to talking about emotions compared to, say, American men or even, you know, we European, European men? Like, what do you think is going on for Australian men with mental health? I think we have a long tradition of being emotionally retarded uh, to <laughs> use, uh, you know, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but I, I just think that we are stunted emotionally as men in this country because there's such emphasis on, on being macho and being strong and going it alone. And, you know, the, 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 you, hear, you hear things like, you know, suck it up, princess, and uh, drink a cup of concrete and all of this bullshit, which really isn't helpful to men who, um, you know, uh, uh, just by virtue of being men, we do tend to uh, keep our feelings to ourselves. We're not as emotionally literate as women. You know, women talk about their feelings often. They get together. They, they solve, you know, problems together. They, they're they not scared and worried about emo and discussing the, the emotional space and, mm -hmm. uh, and becoming vulnerable. Whereas with men, I think we have a deep mistrust of, our, of other men and, and mm. particularly uh, a, a fear of what might come out of us if we do open up. Yeah. And I think that both of those things combine to keep us emotionally isolated and really impact on our mental health in a negative way because I think it's essential to communicate what's going on for us internally 
and emotionally with somebody who we feel safe with and particularly of the same sex that we can yeah. then, you know, that we can get intimate with in, a, in an emotional way and say and, and talk about stuff that affects men and doesn't, you know, women can't relate to that. I yeah. mean, it's, 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 it's in, yeah. in tri- tribal say, culture. culture it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it. it's a shame thing for men. You know, men have right. shame. And, like, if you really think about it, again, just referring to the fact that we're both ethnic, I mean, at a very young age, if you cry or if you do things that aren't part of your role, you're very quickly put back in line. Like, I remember, you know, being four years old and crying somewhere and being told not to cry. So we're actually... I think, do you, do you agree that we need to sort of start at a very early age with boys? Because, you know, um, a lot of boys and teenagers these days are still committing suicide. Like, you know, I had a 13-year-old boy commit suicide two weeks ago that I heard about. Mm. Yeah, I don't like using the word commit because it's it's a shaming word in terms yeah. of uh, it, it brings in the religious connotation of to commit a sin. And, and I think that families tr- struggle to deal with it enough without having the shame of feeling like somebody has committed a sin in their family. So I try and use the word take True. their own life yeah, and, not, okay. and I avoid the word commit only because I just think it's a shaming word. And and you're right, uh, Joe, it, it is so much shame associated with feelings. And I was just reflecting on, on my um, um, parenting as a father with my children. I have a boy, my youngest boy is very, very sensitive and cries at the drop of a hat. And you know, I don't encourage him to to express those feelings. I do feel like, oh, you got to toughen up a little bit. And I sometimes yeah. hear words coming out of my mouth <laughs> that I just go, oh my god, that's I'm I'm shaming him. Do you and feel I like to, I was going to say? Do you feel like you're just you know? Do you are you repeating your dad? Did your dad? No, my father was never. Well, my father wasn't in my life. I didn't have a, a role, a male role model really from the age of eight onwards. Um, but he was tough. He was a man's man, but he wasn't. Uh, you know, shaming of of feelings and expressing feelings and neither was my mum you know like but neither of them were very uh emotionally literate me everyone really you know people of that generation didn't encourage um talk and conversation around feelings you know mm. and it's thought of as fucking feelings you know get over yourself get over it yeah. but you know it's such it's such an important part of who we are and it's and it's something that we really need to you know drop the um you know drop the shaming Drop the the um, the pretense that men can sort of you know just go it alone and be these rocks and mm. and 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 never sh- cry or show emotion. I think that's really toxic, you know. Yeah, and and it's something that's very strong in Australian culture more so than other cultures, you know. Whereas you know we suppose, and, and that's why we have such a problem with um you know high, very high rates of suicide, but also uh, self harm and alcoholism and drug abuse and things like that because men can't cope. We're not meant to be these you know, islands of, and the word island comes from the word isolate, yeah. which means to, you know, be alone. And we're not meant to be alone. We're, in other tribal cultures, men talk to other men. You know, they, they sit down and they share their stories and they talk and, and they make sure that there's, a, there's that kind of level of support. And somehow we've lost that. And I think it's important to, that we bring that back. I don't. I, I sort of don't think. I was just listening to you. I, I sometimes don't, I don't even think we sort of had it. It's still. It's learning to come now. Like I remember a time when I was in my thirties and I was painting my windows at my house, and my dad came to help me. And in that moment, I just said, "I love you." And I turned around and he ran away. Like he literally got <laughs> in the car and left. So it is this sort of thing where um, people are uncomfortable to talk about that stuff because it looks like you're weak. Um, yeah, my there's mother. a weakness. My mother never told me that she loved me until I was like 30 years old. And, you know, I'll never forget, I had a girlfriend who used to hang up the phone call with her mother every time she would sign off by saying, I love you, mum. And I remember listening to her and one day I said to her, why do you always tell her you love her? I mean, surely she knows. She goes, she said to me, oh, it might be the last time I speak to her yeah. and I want her to know that I love her. And I thought, Fuck, that's really profound. I'm gonna yeah. do. I'm gonna start doing that. And yeah. I'll never forget the first time I had a conversation with my mum, and I said the same thing. I said, "I love you, mum," and she said, "What?" <laughs> and I said, "I said I love you," and she said, "Oh, yes, okay. <laughs> um, well, I, I I love you too." And and it was very awkward for her. You yeah. know, she was from uh, you know uh, English sort of uh, well Anglo background, but she went to a private school, and it was very stoic, and it wasn't a love wasn't expressed freely in the family, and. Uh, neither was it emotions, and I think it, you know, it, it, it's damaged a lot of people, you know. Yeah. And um, I think it's time that we acknowledge that we are emotional creatures. We do need to share our, our stories, 
we do need to check in on each other and we 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 need to you know get rid of the stigma of of mental health there's such people don't like talking about it people don't like admitting they're having might be having bad thoughts mm. you know they feel like there's something wrong with them or shameful if they do but you know we we're we're, peop, we're we're part of nature you know and sometimes we have sunny days and we have you know rainy days and we mm. we like the seasons we do change and we go through different areas you know periods of life and and i think it's so important to acknowledge that and to to talk about that stuff you know yeah um, I think also people don't necessarily know how to take vulnerability. It's like when someone passes away and you don't know what to say. We're learning. It's getting there. I think the more, you're right, the more that people talk about it, the better it is. And with the, the I love you thing, I'm not sure if you're aware that the I love you thing is way more important for the person saying it than mm. the person receiving it. Because yeah, right. it, it makes us more comfortable to say it. Like, you know, and then that's how people grow. Like my dad now says it to me because I said it to him. Mm. If I if I waited for him to say it to me, I don't think <laughs> I, he wouldn't have never said it because I don't think his dad ever said it to him. That's exactly right. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. So do you mind if we just go to your acting world? Um, yep. A little bit like I'm curious because you've been in like some um, big movies and I was watching The Matrix the other day. I had no idea that you were in it. So that was really cool. Um, So when you did do those big roles and you're in that big sort of machine of Hollywood and movie making, how is mental health portrayed there? Um, You know, look, when I did Matrix, I was, um, you know, still partying pretty heavily. Uh, I had about three decades of my life where I I really partied heavily and, um, and I don't really remember a hell of a lot about it. <laughs> but uh, I certainly wasn't in a good mental health space, you know. Um, it was the way I was dealing with things. Um, you know, our, but acting by its virtue comes with a lot of uncertainty. It comes with uncertainty. It comes with very high unemployment rate and long periods where you're sitting around waiting for someone to ring and offer you a job. Right. Um, well, at least that's what I was doing and every actor I knew was doing. These days I try and generate my own work. But... Um, at the, in those days, I didn't, didn't, you know, I was at the mercy of someone else. So you're at, mm. in this kind of limbo, waiting for, you know, like a racehorse waiting mm. to race. And, but it's interesting because our perspective is that you're, you know, you seemed always busy. So there's still periods of time that you weren't actually doing anything, right? Yeah, I had long periods of unemployment. Even around that time, I think Matrix was. I had a period of about six, maybe eight months where I was unemployed, uh, and and there was about two months between the audition and actually getting told I had Matrix. Right. And once I had Matrix Reloaded, you know, we went to the States, we did all that. And it was, and it was amazing. It was a, it's a big machine, you know, like you say, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of money um, being spent on the set. And you're a small part of this very, very large machine. And, um, you know, it's, when you think of it that way, it kind of takes away the pressure a little bit. But when you're on set, you know, you do feel the pressure when there's, you know, a crew of 50 people around and you know that every minute is costing them thousands of dollars and mm. um, there's a lot of pressure to get it right. And, you know, I, I don't think I handled that pressure very well. You know, I, <laughs> like I said, partying very, very hard. Well, when and, you go you back know, to that time, was, that, was it also fame? Because I w- I'm always curious to know what would happen, you know, what happened to you once you got famous or once you got recognised? Did that also open up doors for you to sort of party because everyone wants Absolutely. to party with you? Right? Absolutely. I never, I never um, paid for cocaine or booze, you know, like everyone was throwing it at me all the time in Sydney. Cause from the, you know, once I finished police rescue, I was a household name and I was on the cover of magazines and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, it, there was a great big party scene in Sydney, as I'm sure you know. And, and, you know, I loved it. I took to it like a duck to water and it was great. I don't regret a, a, a thing about it. I had a lot of fun, but I did go a little bit hard and maybe I could have probably pulled up five years, 10 years earlier, Mm. but um, I I didn't. Uh, But it's it's a strange thing that happens with fame because you get this um, sense of entitlement. You know, you get an unrealistic sense of reality because people treat you differently. You know, they don't treat you. They they may think they're treating you the same, but they're not. They they look at, they put you up here somewhere. And, and that by its very virtue, stops you from having real conversation because you're not meeting eye to eye you're here and they're there or at least that's where they're putting you and and to a degree when people put you there you sort of behave in that way did you and notice that you said it you know because i, I was going to say like i don't i've never met you until now but now that we're talking and i'm remembering you from shows i feel like mm. i know you so mm. there's that familiarity so mm. did you realize that that was an advantage and then you did you use that or did you of just of course 
Yeah, of course. I've never met a celebrity who hasn't used their celebrity to their own advantage. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's people people open doors for you. They give you the best table at the restaurant. They want to, they want you to give you free shit all the time. You know, they oh wear my jackets or give me you know they give me the two thousand dollar watch. Wear this watch, you know. And um, you know, and I, you know, I, of course, I accepted yeah. it. And, um, and but I was going to say, when did it change? Then when did you? It was was it getting becoming well, a father that you became more? It's a slow process, Joe. I still have a, a disproportionate sense of entitlement. You. Believe me, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not a good thing. I don't think it's a good thing. I think uh, a lot of celebrities struggle with it. I know Keanu Reeves, in particular, is a very real and genuine person. Joaquin Phoenix is another one, and they very real people and genuine. And they struggle with this sense of trying to be normal and fitting in and everyone treating them like they're gods. And, yeah. and it's kind of weird because you can't be normal. I remember sitting down uh, having lunch with Tom Waits uh, on the set of Matrix with Lawrence Fishburne and we sat down and and I didn't know it was Tom Waits. So he had his hair different and stuff. And we, once he, as soon as he started talking, I thought, oh, my God, that's Tom Waits. And we were just, by this stage, we, you know, we were having a conversation and it was all cool. So I just kind of pushed down my starstruckness and, <laughs> and just went, well, we're just having lunch. We're just having a rave. And one of the Aussie actors came and sat next to me and goes, is this who I think it is? And I went, yeah. <laughs> I said, just be cool. Just be cool because we're having a great conversation. Anyway, within two minutes, he blurted out, Tom, I just want to tell you, my mu your music uh, changed my life and blah, blah, blah. And, and he became a fan. Yeah. And from that moment, I could see the shutters come down in Tom Waits and it was, it was a different conversation. Oh, wow. Instead of two people just chewing the fat, it became, oh, fuck, yeah. you're one of those. Yeah. Because you know? I, I guess you're wondering if they want something, isn't it? Well, it just makes they just you... want the fame thing. They just want to be connected to someone that's famous. It's it's automatically makes you feel uncomfortable because you're being looked at as something, as this thing, rather yeah. than just a person. A human. You know? Yeah, true. And, and so, you know, it, it did affect me in that it gave me an unrealistic sense of entitlement, which I had to get over, you know, uh, and I'm still getting over. Um, because you do, you feel a little bit special and you feel mm. a little bit better and you feel like you should, you get served first and all of this bullshit, which, you know, it's, it's not helpful to mm. a, an emotionally healthy human yeah. being. <laughs> Can I, I know this is a personal question and you don't have to answer, but do, you know, was your ego, how did you manage that? E Cause I, you know, I, I've never experienced what you've experienced, but I've had tastes of it like along my life, I guess in smaller ways. How do mm. you tame your ego when it's telling you to just, to just take, take it all? Like how did you how did you actually get to understand that that what you were doing wasn't helpful for you? Well, it, it sort of came uh, when I had a like a rock bottom with um, cocaine and stuff and and booze. I just realised that the partying and that lifestyle was make was going to kill me, and I um, I didn't want to die. Uh, I didn't know how to live uh, without that stuff, and so I had to uh, humble myself and ask for help. And when I did that, I met some a group of people who were also trying to recover from uh, addiction, and they taught me basically that I my ego had to be deflated before I could start to get well. It's and hard, isn't that it? Was, well, it was yeah, it is hard because and ego, high ego and low self esteem go hand in hand, and not many people understand this. They think people with high egos um, actually really love themselves. That's mm. not the truth. People with high egos generally have a very low self-esteem that's why you know we manifest this kind of uh you know this better than sort of outward projection mm. where because we feel less than you know so in order to be accepted i feel i have to put myself above you in order mm. to hide the fact that i feel less than you yeah um and and today i understand that um you know i'm no better or no worse mm. you know we can meet eye to eye as two humans and and that's fine yeah and i can be comfortable in that space i don't have to be above i don't have to be below um yeah sorry, it's I'm interesting not... because i the, the next question i was going to ask a few of my clients which i won't mention names are celebrities and mm -hmm. um they're you know again when i see them on their, on their medium, they would seem like they were the most confident person. And mm. they come and see me for what you just said, confidence and anxiety, which I was mm. blown away by. Do you think that that what you just said then is quite a norm? Like Absolutely. are most celebrities insecure? Well, most celebrities, I think most performers, I wouldn't say celebrities because I don't, can't speak for people who, you know, do reality shows and things like that. I don't know. You know, some people just want to be famous, but Actors, musicians, dancers, performers who actually have taken on the performing arts in some way, um, 
are, I believe, sort of natural, naturally uh, very sensitive people, very highly sensitive people and, and very uh, vulnerable. Um, and, you know, we come across as confident and everything because that's the mask that we have to, you know, if you're a performer, you have to have a healthy ego. And when I say healthy, you have to be able to get in front of people and go, hey, bang, mm. here it is, you know. Um, if you're a singer, certainly, if you're an actor, even, uh, you know, if you're anything, a perform, anything, anything really. uh, you have to have that ability to, to and, and that is a, 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 a requires confidence for sure. But uh, for a true artist, a true artist, uh, uh, anyone who's in the creative fields needs to have a very good dose of of, um, of vulnerability and mm. self and self doubt in order to ask questions. Like you know, I know I only know a couple of actors who uh, you know I know one one or two actors who who are very very famous who have very little self doubt, but I don't think they're very good actors. I think <laughs> I think I think in order to be a good actor, you have to have self doubt. You have yeah. to question yourself. You have to sort of ask those kind of questions. And I, d- I didn't think of that actually. It's like you probably you would use it in your craft, wouldn't you? A hundred percent. You have to ask those questions. Otherwise, if you just think that you're right all the time, how are you ever going to have light and shade in a yeah. performance or vulnerability, which is yeah. so attractive in a performance? You I know, mean, when you hear- yeah, I was going to say you're very vulnerable. Like you're very honest with me today. Mm. Like so, mm. I'm just curious to know how you learnt. How did you? How did you know an Italian guy learn to do that? <laughs> because yeah. you're very, you're sort of just, you know, just saying what you feel is true to you, which I love. You know, mm. was that part of your um, healing and your recovery that you learned to be more, you know, because the, the ego wants us to be right. That's the the job of the ego. Once you learn to tell the ego to go away, and you realize that confidence is really about a man that doesn't think. That's all, a man mm. that does. So how did you learn? Because that's what I'm sort of feeling that you're doing. You're just being in the moment. How did you learn to, to do all that? Who taught you? Uh, well, it was, it was a process. It's been a long process. I mean, I've been in recovery for about 12 years. Um, it'll be 12 years, November 21st, actually. Uh, so it's been a long process of kind of stripping away the layers of ego and all the masks that over the years I've used in order to keep people at bay. And I've actually realized that... Um, to be vulnerable and emotionally articulate is actually a huge strength, not a weakness. Mm. You know, I thought that if I took away the mask, people would hate me or I would be rejected and unloved. No, because then you're just two dimensional. Well, that's right. And people, but, but you know, and people are happy to play that game a lot of the time. They want to put you on a pedestal and stuff. But when you take that mask off and you start to realize that, you know, um, self acceptance and self love. Uh, is the most important thing and what you think of me is none of my business Mm. and and really is of little importance to my happiness you know Mm. because i can people please and try and get everybody in the room to love me and marlon brando said it he said if he said i can be in a room of 200 people who think i'm the best but if i know one person hates me i have to leave (laughs) (laughs) and i thought wow isn't that incredible that brando the best actor ever has given one person that kind of power over him and i Mm. thought no one's going to have that power over me. I'm the I'm the I'm Brando. Brando was a prima donna, though. <laughs> he was, and he you was know? highly insecure and highly yeah. insecure and very vulnerable, and you know. But he was also an egomaniac, and yeah. um, you know. And so I think that the ego does need to be kept in check. You never eradicate it completely because it's you know how we have get our sense of self and everything. But um, you know, we never see ourselves clearly. But I think that, um, you know, to keep it in check regularly, and for me, it's through meditation and spiritual yeah, I gonna, practice. I was going to say, what's your, what's your self-care process like? like so you, you meditate and, and do all that stuff? Yeah, I do. I'm, I have a higher power in my life. Um, you know, like I, I, I don't know what it is or what it looks like. Uh, you can call it God, Shiva, Allah, Buddha, whatever you want to call it, the universe. Um, you know, I, it doesn't really... I don't have an anthropomorphic sort of view of it. It's not uh, physical so much. It's just I do believe that there's um, there's an intelligence and a consciousness that's greater than all of us that keeps us, you know, you know, that gave us life and keeps us, um, you know, keeps us grounded. um, Grounded and 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 well, if we turn to it, you know, I think that we don't turn to it, and that's where we get sick, and that's where we, you know, pick up addictions and things like that when we think that we are. The, the higher power, yeah, and we don't acknowledge that there might be something bigger, and and for me that's been an integral process in not only getting my ego right size, but in getting finding happiness and self acceptance in myself, you know, and 
Um, so that's been a, a big, long journey and a continuing one, you know, an ever-evolving one. I don't well, know. We were talking mind. offline and you were saying that you, well, we found that there's a common interest. So do you want to share a little bit of that? Like, because I was it fascinated how, well, now I understand because of what you just shared with me. So you have an interest in mental health. So do you want to share how that developed? Yeah, I mean, it, it came about really because I was deeply affected by my best friend taking his own life, um, but also, you know, with my wife uh, suffering really severe postnatal depression and going through my own addictions and stuff, I, I really had to look at why, you know, why was I doing this stuff? Why was I trying to kill myself slowly? And why was I um, enraged by uh, things so easily? Why was I rejecting uh, you know, uh, why was my reaction to my wife getting depression? How can you do this to me? You know, <laughs> rather than how can I help? <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, um, yeah, that's what, we're, and, that's what we're trained, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and so I had to sort of unlearn all my selfishness and all that stuff that, um, you know, uh, being a hedonist and uh, um, a narcissist, which I was, you know, and, and, um, and probably still am in some ways, but uh, being, being uh, you know, so focused on myself in that way didn't really prepare me well for fatherhood um, or for, you know, helping others. And I wanted to learn how to do that when my wife got sick and, and I wanted to get well. And certainly I started becoming curious about things like hypnotherapy and the power of meditation and how I could change those that cognitive process that instead of running from all my uh, f bad feelings, um, why not just embrace surrender to them and go, well, let's see what happens. You know, mm. is this anxiety going to kill me if I don't drug myself? You know, is this feeling of uncomfortability at the party without a drink in my hand? Can I get over that? You know, mm. can I go to a party with nothing <laughs> you know, and just a glass of water and be comfortable in my own skin? Mm. These were all questions that, you know, I wanted answers to. And, and today I know that it's possible, but, you know, I had to do a, 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 I had to do a lot of work on myself in order to um, so It was like know, a flip, a wasn't it? I mean, like, it's interesting. You called yourself a narcissist and then now you're doing all this self-help and you're studying and all that. So it was a big flip. I mean, I know you said it was a long time, but how did everyone else view your change? Like, for example, your wife and your parents and your friends? Like, because you were probably showed a big shift to them yeah yeah look a lot of my friends from that old days um I, I don't longer speak to and it's not um it's not any sort of ill feeling on my part it's just that we grew apart you know yeah, they, the weren't, they weren't on the same page were they no different page completely i think my wife was you know uh, super grateful that i got well and getting well and because uh, she i doubt she'd stick she would have stuck around <laughs> um anybody who loved me I, I would hurt you know like because i was so selfish in my addiction and, but that's uh, the interesting thing steve see like you said that your wife will have left you but i think that if you didn't change you probably would have left her probably yeah you know what yeah, i mean you're right because, well you know, you're you, right. Were, you were freaking out but then something that's inside right. of you like your values or I don't know, something tapped you on the shoulder and said, hey, it's time to, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but you sort of grew up. Yeah, 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 that's right. Well, you know, the, 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 that's I call it the king baby complex. The king you know, baby and, complex. And, and I think a lot of celebrities, male celebrities in particular, have the king baby complex because we get given everything. You know, we meta metaphorically get our asses wiped for us, you know. And so it's like you can't be an adult when you you know you can't even wipe your own bottom you know i mean uh, and you can't be an adult when you have everyone just you know telling you how great you are all the time and giving you this it must false be, it must be a total head spin it's you not know? it's not a healthy way to live <laughs> let me tell you it's yeah that's why so many um artists you know successful artists end up you know in rehab and things like that i think because you know, they don't know how to cope with reality. You know, they don't know yeah. how to cope with the, the the things that, and it's not just celebrities. A lot of people, anyone who suffers from any kind of addiction um, finds it difficult to to just live a normal life. Yeah. You know? Do you think, do you think this whole social media fame thing is, um, is similar? You know how, like, yeah. people now are becoming, like, you know, you're talented and you've worked hard to get to where you are, but, like, people now are becoming famous for nothing. <laughs> you know and, I don't, and yeah. they've got millions of people and they're getting thousands of dollars given to them and i still can't get my head wrap my head around it so do you think that they're going to experience the same problems oh absolutely absolutely how are they ever going to fucking live up to their instagram filter yeah they're going to have know, breakdowns aren't how, they? How are they 
how are they how are they going to live up to that? You know, like if I look at some celebrities and there's you know a, a, a man, a very famous man who comes to mind, who's you know recently sort of opted out of the mainstream media. And I just recently saw a couple of his things on Instagram, and, and he's fucking insane. You know, he's completely insane. <laughs> I think you know? I know who you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I and I know the guy. I've met him, and I've partied with him a couple of times back in the day. But you know, uh, without naming names, he, you know, he's, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I think that the some of those people. Um, do you think it's chemical? Yeah, yeah, I do. But I also think that, uh, you know, it's, it is like a drug, this insatiable need to be kind of validated through social media. Well, I think that's the thing. I think fame now is the new drug. Like, yeah, you know, in yeah. your time, that's right. when People... you started, you were special, right? We looked up. But now everyone that's, you know, I've asked teenagers in workshops, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the answer was famous. Famous. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> that's like... right. And they don't give a shit how they get there. It's no, like, that's why. Uh, that's, yeah, the entitlement thing. The... Yeah, and and it's interesting because fame is seen as this golden ticket. Fame is seen as this ticket to happiness. And I can tell you from from personal experience and knowing people who are much more famous than me that that um, fame is not does yeah. not lead to happiness at all. In yeah. fact, quite the opposite is true. Yeah. You know, a humble life, you know, a, an honest life, and a good life where you know you can be of service to people and. You know, it doesn't mean you can't be famous, but you have to have something more. You have to be a nice, nice person as well. You have to be nice to yourself and others. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you can't be sort of swanning around feeling better than people because you're famous because you've got 5 million followers on Instagram or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know, like that's not – that's a empty – and it's, a you know, it's – what is social media? It's a collection of people's greatest hits. Yeah. You know, you don't see them going – Oh fuck! I'm I'm like crying in my pillow today because I I just have a helpless feeling of of doom. You know, like <laughs> I want to kill myself this morning. You know, like you don't see that on social media. You see them basking you, by the you, pool. You, you've got the wrong friend, Steve. Yeah, because <laughs> I, I see them like every day. I know I know you've got to go, but I want to ask you one last question. So uh, you sort of covered it just now with that answer. But what advice would you give to someone who is you know, young or even, you know, any age group that's pursuing a, a, a career in acting and um, what do you think from your experience that they should learn? Uh, learn the craft, you know, learn theatre. Yeah, okay. But what yeah. I mean is do you think that they, if that you could do things differently, like would you give them any advice in regards to how to, to manage doing, going into that career without being sort of a little bit over the top, crazy, insecure, all those sort of things? I, I don't think that's possible. I think that if you embark on a career in show business, you're going to get all of those things. You're going to get um, insecure. You're going to get um, distorted perception of reality sometimes if you make it big. Right. You're going to get people offering you, you know, mind-altering chemicals. You're going to have uh, you know, constant rejection. You're going to have a lot of things that are going to impact on your mental health if you don't realise that before you know, we're human beings, not human doings. And so we're valuable as humans, regardless of our output creatively, you know, and I think if, if you take care of the inside, the outside will take care of itself, you know, and these days, a lot of young people are locked on the outside, yeah. you know, they want to have muscles, they want to have the hair, they want to have everything, plastic teeth, surgery. Everything, plastic, everything perfect on the outside, but the inside's falling apart. So I think that, you know, if you look at some great actors, you see what comes through their eyes, it's not the colour. It's yeah. not the, you know, the whites of their teeth. It's the strength that they have inside them, the power inside them that comes out. And that, if you nurture that power, I think if you, if you take care to cultivate that inner world, then it's going to translate in your outer world. So my, my advice to actors would be have fun with it. Don't take it too seriously and work on yourself inside, you know, like, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for talking to us. And I didn't get, I mean, I could talk to you for hours, but um, yeah. I've, also congratulations on your short film festival that I saw your, you. I saw your logo and that looks really cool. So can Great. you maybe, when's that going to, when's that on? Is it in summer? Yeah, that's that's on March the 6th and it's on cool. at the Peninsula, uh, at the Dramana Drive-In. So it's the Peninsula Film Festival. You can check us out on Facebook. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, put, I'll, put, I'll, put all, I'll put all your links at the long time. Right. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Podcast. And then we'll talk soon about your other interests. Thanks for having me on, Joan. I'll come on again when uh, when I have a bit more time and and I, and I have something further to say. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, man. Have, have a good Joan. day. 
You and too. we've been listening Cheers. to the Secret Men's Business Podcast. The podcast is out Mondays and Thursdays. So make sure you um, click like and hit the bell so you get notified when a new episode's out. And don't forget we're on um, the, listening, the listening platforms and also on YouTube now on SMB TV. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Mm-hmm.